I believe we'll talk about Eric Erickson. Okay. <clears throat> An interesting guy. Um, he was, uh, he was um, uh, born out of wedlock. Um, I don't know enough about him to know whether or not this, this had um, impact on his choice of career and his subsequent later life. You know, my guess is that it was probably something to do with that. Um, uh, uh, my dad was very good friends with Eric Erickson. So I never met him, but I heard lots of stories about him from my dad. Um, and uh, my dad used to meet with him, hang out with him, do stuff together, I don't know. Um, uh, again, this is a guy who was really, really influential, not just in psychoanalysis, but in the wider world of psychology, which is kind of amazing because really, you know, academic psychologists don't like uh, Freud, they don't like Freudians, and yet every single um, uh, psychology major student in every single college, at least in this country, will learn about Eric Erickson. Okay? You'll all take developmental psychology, right? Um, you will learn about Eric Erickson in developmental psychology, in developmental psychology class. Um, we're going to go over here again. So if you're taking developmental, just consider this is a repeat. Um, You'll probably go into more detail in developmental psychology, but we'll, we'll go over the high points here of Erickson's stuff. Um, he never got a college degree. So he, <coughs> the guy never went to college, or he maybe went, but he never got a college degree, never finished. Um, he started working like kind of what you think is sort of like a social worker kind of person. And then he ends up working with Anna Freud and becomes, he was analyzed, I believe he was analyzed by Anna Freud, and he becomes a child analyst. <coughs> so his clinical work is with kids for the most part. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, he moved to the United States in 1933. And he, um, even though he doesn't have a college degree, he's pretty widely known. He writes a number of very, very well-received books. He does um, almost anthropological-like studies of, of child-rearing in different Indian tribes, two different Indian tribes, um, uh, the Sioux in South Dakota and the Yurok, Yurok, I'm getting that, maybe getting that wrong, Indians who are in the, on the coast somewhere, I think in maybe in Oregon. The book says it, right? It's somewhere in your book. And he compares these two, and they have very different child-rearing strategies. <coughs> He is not super um, enthralled with the way the Sioux raised their children. The Sioux raised their children in a, in a traditional way where the kids are uh, basically allowed to run around and rule the roost and not given a lot of structure and, and guidance. And, um, and they grow up thinking that the world you know, should you know, basically be friendly to them and be nice to them. I'm paraphrasing here, and give them what they need, and then they grow up and find out that they are a member of this uh, Native American group that has been, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not really going to say this nicely, essentially the subject of genocide, you know, uh, which is one way you can look at the way Native Americans in this country are treated, kind of a slow motion genocide, and, um, you know, their, their traditional way of life taken away from them, and their ways of making a living um, are, 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 are difficult. Their culture, you know, has to adapt to the, to the culture of the conquerors, essentially, having a difficult time with that. And so um, it, it really is at stark odds with the way the kids are brought up. The way they're brought up in this sort of permissive environment does not prepare them for being a Native American on a reservation in modern America. And so this guy, so according to Erickson, this causes a lot of problems for them. Okay? As opposed to the Yurok Indians who grow up and they're very pessim more pessimistic and they're more strict with the kids and more uh, authoritarian. And um, uh, their culture, the kids graze up and they're, they're, they're much better prepared for being part of uh, American culture. And that they do much better. Also, the way that the Yuroks make their living, which is salmon fishing, also is much more... Um, brought them into much less conflict with, with uh, you know, with uh, European settlers 
in this country, so they have a very different experience. And so Erickson compares these two. He makes a comparison of these two. And it's a very interesting work. I read it a long time ago. It's a very interesting piece of work. Um, it reads very anthropological-like. He's really much the participant observer kind of anthropology framework. And this kind of, a lot of Erickson's work really sort of um, seems like this. Very interesting. Uh, he's a good writer. His writing is very readable. Um, I'm sure you guys, if you haven't read Erickson, you probably will at some point. Um, you can sit down and read Erickson's book, like you pick a book, you could probably read it in a day or so. It's pretty easy, pretty easy to read. Um, and again, he becomes very popular because of this. Um, he, he writes a lot. He becomes pr relatively famous. He's in various academic positions, even though he doesn't have a college degree. And he ends up at Harvard. Uh, where, you know, Harvard cherry picks, that's how they get their professors. Um, and, you know, a famous guy eventually comes there and they, 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 uh, they offer him a professorship and he stays there until he retires. And I believe when he retires, he moves to Northern California. He's in Marin County, I think. Because my dad used to go visit him over in Marin County. So I think he's, he ended up his days in Marin County. Unfortunately, um, you know, he wrote a lot about, we're going to talk about his stages, we'll talk about uh, old age. Um, unfortunately for Erickson, he, um, he really, uh, when he gets very much older, he really is quite demented. He has, um, I don't know if it's Alzheimer's, but it's some kind of very severe dementia. And by the time he dies, he's really, really out of it. Um, I remember my dad went to see him right before he died. And he came back and I said something to him like, well, how's, how's Eric doing, you know? And he said, he said, well, Eric's not, hasn't been around for a while. You know, Eric's, and Eric's been gone for a while, uh, and his body's now, you know, on the way out. And um, so I, I do know that about him, which is kind of very sad for such a smart guy and a guy who'd, who'd done all these amazing things. Um, his wife, Joan Erickson, um, uh, also was a very uh, smart person and wrote uh, quite a bit and wrote a bit about uh, the, the stage of old age. And... Um, and she has to work on that. I think your book references that, which is also very good to read. So that's the overview of, of Erickson. Any questions about Erickson as the person? Yeah. Actually, yes. Um, I've heard some um, different stories of why he renamed himself Erickson, and one of them was that he didn't have a very good relationship with his parents so that he renamed himself Erickson, the son of Eric, of Eric Oh, himself. that's interesting. That's interesting. I'm I didn't sure know that. That's true. I didn't know that, huh? Like he said that he was I'll like I'll ask his, my dad. My okay. dad would know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, well, he had, I don't know if it was, he, his parents didn't tell him that he was adopted until much later. And then my idea is, you know, if you look at his psychology, the idea is that when he found this out, then he had the need to, to form an identification not with his presumed father, but with, you know, with, with, you know, his real father who wasn't around. And so that's, I think that has something to do with changing his name. Um, and I think the other thing, maybe having to do change with him, I can't remember if this is true or not, is maybe the fact that he had some Jewish heritage and wanted to cover that up, um, which would have been, you know, in, I mean, but he, he, he gets to the United States before the Nazis. I mean, the Nazis are just starting to take power in the early 30s. Uh, but that might have something to do. There was a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in this country, too, by the way. Um, I mean, the Nazis were especially bad, but there was, there was anti-Semitism everywhere. So that also may have been uh, had, having, having something to do with it. He takes a name that is very, very uh, sort of Aryan in nature, you know. But, you know, I'll ask my dad next time I talk to him about that. Because he would know about Erickson's name. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He knew him pretty well. Yeah. I mean, they were, they, were, they were not just college. They were, they were pretty good friends, I think. So I'll ask him about that. Um, I'll send him an email and ask him. Yeah. Thanks. Question. Yeah. All right. Uh, OK, so Erickson's influence on psychoanalytic theory. Um, again, uh, looking from more of the point of the ego. And one thing you can think about Erickson's developmental stages is that they are stages that really um, come from the viewpoint of the ego rather than the id. 
In other words, they're looking more about how the ego, ego sort of um, maintains uh, uh, control, if you will, over the id in certain developmental stages. So he's taking Freud's developmental stages and he's looking at sort of the ego really um, develops and maintains control over the id in these stages and also how this affects the person, the child, the developing child, the adult uh, in, their, in their social relationships with the person as part of society. So this is why Erickson stages are called psychosocial stages of development. Uh, he extended the concept of development to embrace the entire lifespan. So it was not just childhood, like most developmentalists just mostly focused on childhood. Erickson really extended this to the whole lifespan. Um, now, you should know that um, lifespan uh, concepts of development are not limited to Erickson and Western psychology, that other, other um, uh, systems of thought have this concept of development uh, of the whole lifespan development. A good example is in Hinduism. Hinduism has a very pro well worked out concept of, of lifespan development, you know, through old age, from birth through old age. Um, so these ideas, these sort of psychosocial stages of development are not unique to Erickson. I mean, the way he worked them out is unique, but I mean, the idea of, 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 a, of, 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 a, of a lifespan, uh, developmental lifespan is not, is not something that is, um, unique to Western psychology. Again, if you take my other class, I'll go into more detail about this. Okay. Um, Erickson does look at the impact of culture, society, and history on the development of personality. So he's also looking how the outside impinges on what's going on internally for the developing person. Okay. And this is very important. The other way you can also look at it, this, you can also look and see, you can turn this statement around. And you can look and see how the developing personality has an impact on culture and society. And that's a very interesting way of looking at things. And this is, if you look at Erickson's, you go back to his study of the Indians, Native Americans, you can really see that that's, really Erickson's turning this, this phrase around. It's the development of the personality of an individual and how that then affects the lifestyle and the culture of the people that person is with. And we have a bunch of people developing in a certain culture and having certain personality things how does that affect you know, how they live, their society, their interactions with other people? So that part of it is really interesting to me. I find that part very interesting. Okay, psychosocial stages of development, you guys, uh, it, how, how many people here have, have, have had these before in another class? How many people have not had them before? Okay, just one, just Katie. Okay, well, you're gonna get them in another class. <laughs> so. Just to give you the punchline already, you're going to probably run across these. Maybe even more. How many people have seen these in more than one class? Yeah. So this is a big deal in psychology, and people really this really made a big impact on people. So these are the first number of these. These are the same as as um, as uh, Freud's uh, stages: trust versus mistrust, oral stage, autonomy versus shame and doubt, anal stage, niches versus guilt. Oedipal stage, industry, industry versus inferiority, this is latency, ego identity versus role confusion, intimacy versus isolation, uh, ego identity, this is adolescence, this is sort of Freud's adolescent stage, Freud sort of ends here. But then uh, uh, Erickson adds intimacy versus isolation, generativity versus stagnation, and ego integrity versus despair. Okay? And so each developmental stage has an ego strength attached to it, uh, something that the ego develops uh, during that stage. So the first one would be hope, next one will, purpose, competency, fidelity, love, care, and wisdom. Uh, those are the ego strengths that, 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 that develop in these stages. Trust versus mistrust, um, and I think we're actually now we'll go through each one of these. Oops. Life cycle. Okay, let's. Oh, it's not going to go through in detail. Okay. Um, so we'll just talk about these briefly. Trust versus mistrust. This is where the very young infant, um, who's experiencing the world primarily with their mouth, um, learns to trust the world. Learns to trust that you know that you know the mother will take care of them. Um, that uh, the world will respond to them. When, you know, baby cries. That somebody will come and take care of it. And so a 
a person who starts out their life uh, when, with parents who uh, attend to them, attend to their needs, learn to develop a sense of trust, okay? trust in the world, trust in, in their parents. And this sets the groundwork for the next stage. So each stage sets the groundwork for the next stage. Okay? Each one sets this groundwork for the next stage. Um, if something goes awry in this stage, then the infant experiences mistrust. The world becomes a, a frightening, uh, inconsistent place. And this can lead to lots of problems later on because if, you, if, you, if something goes awry in one of the stages, that whatever, whatever is going awry there carries over up into the other stages and can, the person can be more or less, become, can become sort of fixated on that stage, but they can also, like, for instance, you, could, you can carry this mistrust into the later stages and this can create all sorts of problems. The earlier the problems, the earlier the stages the problems arise at, the worse the pathology, the, wor the worse that the personality is put together. Okay, again, another general rule of thumb. Okay. Uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt. This is where the kid, um, you know, the, the anal stage, this is where the kid is doing toilet training and the shame and doubt you know, is obvious. You know, uh, the kid that learns autonomy, they learn autonomy over their own bodily functions. Right, how to control their, their, their excretory functions. Um, if they're not able to do that, there's a lot of shame attached to that, um, especially in our society, a lot of shame attached to that. But it's not just the anal stage stuff, it's also stuff having to do with autonomy. And so, you know, that, 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 the, that the kids are learning to become um, separate, they're starting to see themselves as separate from their parents. What is the word that the two-year-olds use most often? You guys know this? What words do two-year-olds use most often? No. You don't remember when you were two, because you're all healthy and you've repressed your early childhood memories. But if your parents were here, what would they tell me was the word you used during when you were two? No. No. It's the word that expresses autonomy. And it is no, right? No, I'm a, se when a little kid says no, they're saying, no, I'm a separate person. I will do what I want to do not what you want me to do, big omnipotent parent creatures, right? And this is what kids do. And this is the, the kid learning to be autonomous. Anybody ever kid, see a kid with their mother, like a two, three-year-old kid with their mother? What do these kids do? Well, they're in the park with mom. Little kid's in the park with mom. Mom's sitting there. What does the kid do? Run around. Say it again. Run around. Run around. Where's the kid run around to? Do they run to the mom or do they run away from the mom? Away from the mom. And what do they do when they run a little way, they run a little way from the mom? What's the next thing they do? Before they come back. Yes. How do they do that? Perfect. And you go to the park and go see some moms with little kids. You can do this today as an experiment and just sit there for 10 minutes and watch them. And you'll see the little kid, two-year-old kid, you know, I've been walking, just learning to run, right? Mom is there, the kid will look back, see mom, and the kid will go and take off, right? And if mom is patient, mom will instead of go, oh, freaking out, like, ah, mom is patient, mom will just sit there, the kid will run it off, go to the other side, and then that kid will stop, turn back, his mom's still there, right? So this is this is the this is the main thing in the states. The kid is is um, wanting autonomy. There's a drive toward autonomy, but at the same time, they also they're also very dependent on the parents. And there's a fear that if they run away and they express autonomy, that the parent will go away. They'll lose that security of the parent. And so the kids are acting this dilemma out, right? Acting this dilemma out. You can see it in the park any day. Yes? So what happens if they don't have that, like, depend, and they don't have, like, the parent that cares for them? Ah, like, they, have they don't have the parents problems. staying around, like, they run off and the parent's not there. And yeah, so if the parent's not there, what you'll see is the kid will run off, or the parents are neglectful, the kid will run off and won't look back and just keep meandering around, you know, get into trouble. Um, somebody will then come and scold the kid, you know, or the parent will then come and neglect the kid, but then, you know, the kid's gone, finally realize it, go find the kid and, like, beat the kid or yell at the kid, and, and that kid will learn that autonomy is dangerous, okay? 
it's dangerous to like go out on your own. It's dangerous to be separate from mommy. Okay, so that's one one thing that can happen, and that that then stunts the kid for the later stages, right? Or the the, the parent could um, the the parent could be it could be dangerous for the kid not to have autonomy. You know, the parent's really dangerous, and the kid experiences the parent is dangerous. They have a lot of mistrust left over from the first one, and so that kid's always trying to escape the parent. And when they can't escape the parent, they get super frustrated and angry. Again, something that will feed into these things later on. Or the kid becomes, the kid is so mistrustful that the kid never bothers to leave the parent. Okay? The kid clings to mommy. You can be in the park, you'll see this too. It's a kid, little kid that clings to mommy. Okay? It doesn't go away. Now what happens when that kid uh, starts kindergarten? Anybody ever gone to a, you guys are all too young for this. Anybody have brothers and sisters? Have you ever gone to the kindergarten class, the first day of kindergarten? What do you see happens? Anybody ever, ever taught kindergarten in the kindergarten class? Okay, what happens first day of kindergarten, right? The kids There's come in, first day, mom drops them off, and, and what do the kids do? My mother was really attached to my mom and wouldn't leave her side and yeah. was crying. Crying. And the moms, the good moms will say, nope, you got to leave. I'm leaving now. We'll be back later. Talk about object constancy in a little bit. Um, maybe the next chapter, and the kids, the mom parents leave, and the kids do what? Wah, right? Then what do most of the kids do after about five or ten minutes? Go play. Go play. Completely Go forget their parents. <laughs> you know, completely forget about them. You know, and, and they stop. And there's, there's kids, there's these new adults, there's interesting things, and they they they, they go on and 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 stop crying. There's always one or two kids that are inconsolable. Those are the kids who've had trouble in these first two stages for whatever reason. Okay? Not that the parents are necessarily bad, but something didn't get negotiated properly here. Okay? Um, the same thing when you see toilet training. Toilet training is the other one that's very common in this age. Uh, most kids, and, and the thing about toilet training is a lot of it is, um, is, is physiological, that the body uh, that their bodies have to develop to a certain point where they can control the sphincter, they can control, you know, whether they pee or not. Um, and sometimes what happened is that it used to be that that um, parents would be very strict about this, and they would be telling the kid to control their bowels uh, when the kid wasn't physiologically able to do it yet. They were sort of forcing the kid to be autonomous when he couldn't physiologically do it, and this led, leads to a tremendous amount of frustration. And again, if you read Freudian stuff about the, the you know the anal expletive and the anal retentive stages, all have something to do with this. Um, but what happens is the the kid will, if they're not able to, to do the toilet training, they'll experience shame and doubt. They'll doubt their abilities to be autonomous. They'll experience shame anytime they're trying to be autonomous. They'll experience shame with this. Okay, and this is again something that can carry over into later life. Normal kids, you know, what happens is their bodies get to the point where they're physiologically, they can control their functions. Uh, they, you know, have a patient uh, parent or caregiver, and, um, and then, you know, it's, it happens like that. And then the kid's very proud of it, you know, like, oh, look what I made, you know, like, you know, look what I was able to do, right? It's a point of pride for the child, right? And again, the parents should be reinforcing that, that autonomy in the kid. The child's becoming autonomous, right? So if you reinforce that, it's great. If you say, oh, you didn't do it good enough, or you splashed on the thing, or whatever, you know, and you know, rail at the kid for that, then that undermines their sense of autonomy, and that causes problems later on. Okay. And again, when you do uh, therapy with somebody, sometimes you can start getting back to some of these, un these memories, if they've been traumatic, you know, the, the kid will actually start, the person will start to be able to recall that stuff. You know, and realize that you know you can kind of as a therapist realize where the uh, where the person's uh, 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 pathology is stemming from because of the way they're manifesting uh, stuff in their adult life will reflect back onto these these stages. Oh, I this computer. Okay. They'll reflect back onto these stages, and you can kind of see this. And you see this in the person who's kind of like the obsessive compulsive personality. You know, everything's got to be neat and clean and kept in thing. Or the expletive personality where their, you know, their house looks like an episode of Hoarders. You know, those are the examples, extreme examples. But you see just in general in between sort of characteristics. 
these kind of things. Person is very controlling, you know. Um, that would be that would that would signify the second stage. Okay. Sorry about this. Okay. Does anybody can anybody think in their own life? And again, you do not have to respond to this in their own life where they had some significant um, thing, either good or bad, that happened in these early stages. Yes? Uh, my mom used to give me a cold shower every time I peed in my bed. Uh -huh. She's uh -huh. like, you pee, now you get a cold bath. And it was really icy. Was that cold. older though? Were you older? Uh, no, I think I was four or five Four would be old. older. Yeah, that's older. Yeah. That's a different uh -huh. thing. That's a different right. thing. A little bit, like maybe three. Three, three maybe four. close. Um, really, you're talking about kids around two. Yeah, you know, that I don't know. In the two, two to three year old range in this, this time. I think your book has the, the ages more specifically. There's some variation among people. Okay, there's some variation among people. Um, this is a hard, most of you probably won't remember when you were two. I'm guessing, right? Anybody remember when they were two? No? No memories, yeah. So that's good. We repress those things. Okay. Uh, the next one, initiative versus guilt. This is uh, this is the Oedipal stage, and the idea here is that um, if you are able to uh, go through this, you will be able to sort of take the initiative of things. You'll be able to initialize things. You'll be able to um, uh, way kind of create purpose. And you will, you know, you'll be able to actually, um, I think of the stage as sort of the, the genesis of creativity. What should folks say about this? Uh, so they say children are active in their environment, mastering new skills and tasks. No, wait a minute, this is the right one? Yeah. Um, I like what they said the book, this is an interesting line in your book. Uh, the bodies vigorously intrude into space and onto other people. Their intrusion and curiosity extends not only to sexual matters, but to many other specific goals and achievements as well. And the characteristic word of this is, this is preschool age kids, is why. And so what you see in the age of these kids is they are always sort of like pushing forward into things or getting into things. They, they, they become curious about stuff and they now have something like a, almost a purpose driving, the, driving their curiosity. Okay, this is very interesting. So, as opposed to just the, the standard Oedipal complex, where the kid, you know, wants to have sex with mommy, but the boy wants to have sex with mommy, but he can't, so, or he doesn't really want, doesn't really know what sex is. He wants to marry mommy, but he can't, he realizes he can't, so he identifies with the father, he has castration anxiety. There's also this idea that kids are probing and getting into things. They're intrusive, right? If you see little little boys and girls at this age, you know, they're, they're, they're very intrusive, as opposed to the kid who's, who's two or three years old, you know, you if you meet a kid like this and you're a stranger, that kid will kind of hold back, right? They'll kind of go, you know, you come in, you ever met a kid, a little kid like this? You know, the kid's out running around, you know, kind of figuring out autonomy, looking at mommy, you show up, the kid runs back to mommy and gets behind her, sort of stranger anxiety, right? Which, by the way, as you know, you might imagine, has a great evolutionary uh, fitness. It's adaptive to be scared of strangers when you're that young. By the time the kids get to this age, you come into the room, that kid's gonna make a beeline towards you and wanna know all about you, start asking questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you wearing big shoes? Why are you holding a briefcase? Why are you, you know, like, mm, you know. So this is what they mean when the kid, they're talking about the kids being intrusive, right? The kids are being intrusive. Um, if this, um, the, the task of the parent here, according to Erickson, is to reinforce the child for this goal-oriented behavior. To reinforce this, this is a good behavior. You know that you know let the kids know, do it safely, but you know reinforce this kind of behavior. The the, the 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 parenting mistake here will be to chastise the kid for this kind of thing, and this will this will engender because it's at this Oedipal stage. This will engender guilt in the child, and then they'll feel like any time that there's something new or there's they want to go out and explore the environment or do something that they'll, they'll have a tremendous feeling of guilt for this. And this is something you see in therapy when you do therapy with people. People who might, you know, have been, you know, as children, they may have had some ambition. And then as adults, they seem to not have any ambition at all. Their ambition is squelched, or it's very limited. 
because having any ambition toward anything greater than maybe a very small, very modest goal engenders you know, tremendous feelings of guilt. In it. And guilt, what goes along with guilt is the, it's, 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 it's sister anxiety, right? You know, so the castration anxiety, especially for men. Women, it's not quite as much, but the boys, the anxiety is really intense. Right, so you'll see this, and so this is this is a this is a um, the way Erickson looks at this is sort of a wider uh, viewpoint here, okay? a wider viewpoint here. Um, I have a feel, I have a thought about this, which I, fits with Erickson and Freud, and that is that also the kid is learning to and again, don't steal my idea. This is my idea. Don't steal it. Um, that the kid is, at this point, from an evolutionary standpoint, as, as the, the human child being a primate child, like other primates, is learning now the first inklings of learning to exist in the dominance hierarchy of their society. Okay? That primates exist in dominance hierarchies. Right? And the first dominance hierarchy you encounter is your parents. Okay? Your parents are, you know, your one parent, your mother, maybe. You know, the first one, you have to learn to deal with just one parent being this dom, they're, they're, they're superior to you, you know, they, you're dependent on them. And so the second stage is you're developing autonomy just with, it, with, that, one, with that one person who's dominant over you. In the, in the, in the Oedipal stage, in the industri in industry versus inferiority stage, you are, or, sorry, the initiative versus guilt stage, the child is now learning to exist in a dominant hierarchy of more than one person. Initially, it's just the two parents, and especially the same sex parents. Okay, who you have this rivalry with, right? Because in, in the real world, when you grow up, you're going to be in a world with all these people. You're now practicing being in that dominance hierarchy with your, in your parental unit. And for kids, especially in our society, you're starting to interact with other kids and other people. You're going to preschool. There's some now moving, more autonomy going here. And now you're having to like exist with these other people and learning to exist with other people. And finding your place in the dominance hierarchy, okay? And this is how I see it, and, I, and I, I interpret Erickson this way. So you're a little child, right, and you are learning that you are not going to be able to uh, take over the dominance hierarchy. You try, you go and intrude into people's space, but then you come to the realization that you are not the dominant creature, and then you take your place in the dominance hierarchy, which is in the appropriate place under the adults, because the adults are over you. Your parents are, they have control over you. You can't dominate them. And this is where these parenting style things come in. If you're a permissive parent, then the child thinks they won the dominance hierarchy, and that they're the, they're, the, they're the alpha animal. And this creates all sorts of problems for them later when they get in the real world and they realize that's not the case. Okay? Um, so I, I look at this as just the beginning of, of, of being able to function in society in a dominance hierarchy. Okay? And what happens when you, when you have a problem here, you get guilt, but you also get a lot of confusion. I call this, I trademark this, dominance hierarchy confusion. You don't negotiate this stage well, you get into the next stage where you're now really starting to be in society with different people. You don't know how to, you don't know how to where, you, where you stand in that society. And again, you can see this in animals. Uh, this is quite apparent in, uh, in dogs, for instance. Anybody here watch Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer? Right? I think he's one of the best psychologists ever. This is his primary way of treating dogs. His, his thesis is, oh, well, you guys, what, anybody watch him? What, what's his primary thesis? What's the primary thing that she's... the leader of the pack? Yeah. And what does that mean? What, what is the dog, what is the dog experience, experiencing before Caesar Milan comes in? Confusion. They, they want to be in control. They want to be in control, but they also don't know what? How to be in control. They don't know how to be in control, and they don't know if they should be in control. Right. And so you go to the backyard, the dog's running around, chasing its tail, biting, trying to bite you, right? It does, it's confused. It doesn't know where in the pack it should be, right? It doesn't know if it should be the leader, depending on how the parents have raised the dog. It doesn't know if it should be submissive. It vacillates between the two things, and it's very, very confused. And so what does Caesar Milan do? What's his process? What does he do? Comes into the dogs. What does he do with the dog? Looks in the red. He establishes he's in charge. He establishes the dominance hierarchy. He says, "Oh, dog, you are confused about this. Where you are in the hierarchy, 
So now I'm going to make it very clear to you. And he does it first with just himself. Mm -hmm. I am the dominant creature, and you are submissive to me. And then the dog, you see, you watch him. You see the dog's like, Rrr, and then the dog, like, the, the light bulb clicks on, like, oh, the dog goes, oh, oh, I'm not confused anymore. I'm the submissive one. He's dominant over me. I'm, this is where I am in the dominant arc. I'm under this individual. Okay, and the dog, you can see it in the TV show, the dog just clicks, and he's good. What's the next thing that Caesar Milan does with that dog? Now the dog's good with Caesar Milan's behaving with him. He puts him with the pack. He puts him with the pack. And then the dog goes out and has to be in the dominance hierarchy with all these other dogs. And it has to figure out where it is in that pack among these other dogs. Right? This is exactly what Erickson is talking about here. In my, my Kevin way of viewing this thing. It's exactly what he's talking about here. That you are, you are, you are, you know, you, you establish this with your parents, where you are in the dominance hierarchy. And then you go out, you go to, you go to next stage, you're going to go to school. You're going to start first grade, you're going to start kindergarten. And now you're thrown in the room with a bunch of people. Your parents aren't around anymore. And now, like Caesar's dogs in the pack, you have to figure out where you are in the pack. Normal kids um, don't have a problem doing this. Okay, it's fairly easy. So I said in the kindergarten class, literally within ten minutes, everybody has figured everything out. All the kids are happy and they're having fun, and this is a new experience. It's exciting. But then you have a couple kids. Who, for instance, don't don't uh, negotiate this stage well. Maybe they have, maybe the, the parents have uh, you know over dominated them, or they think that they are dominant. Parents have been too permissive or too authoritarian, and they might feel a lot of guilt about either of those things. And so they come into this situation, and then what happens is when they go to the next one, they don't know how to fit in with everybody else. And they, they very quickly become an outcast. Okay. Everybody experienced this with a group of people? When you were a kid, there was that one kid who just didn't seem to be able to fit in very well. Just whatever, they said something wrong or they just acted in a way that was weird. Maybe they tried too hard or they tried to be too, they were too submissive or too dominant. They couldn't just figure out how to sort of get in with the sort of feeling of the group, right? You had that experience? This is for Erickson, it's this thing. This is what the reason is. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next one, industry versus inferiority. This is Freud's latency period. This is where the child learns to um, uh, uh, the technologies and basic things necessary for survival in that society. Okay. So for our society, what are some of the basic things that kids learn? Maybe. What do you think, Elizabeth? What are basic things kids learn to, to survive in our society? Like Six or seven years old. What are they learning? Regarding in general or just? Just in general, yeah. Well, I think, um, I guess, well, I mean, you know, they're little, so they don't have a lot of responsibilities. But I guess just adapting in school. Well, what do we do? What do, what do kids learn in school? You're six years old, you go to first grade, what are you learning? Rachel? Sharing? Yeah. That goes with the dominance hierarchy yeah, thing. Just going to school. What do you learn in school? What do you do in the first grade? Yeah. You learn how to read and write. Read and write. Read and Basic and things necessary for existing in our society. Okay? How many people here have ever been to uh, another country? How many people here have been to another country where they use a different alphabet? Different language, okay? How many people have been in these countries where there's different alphabet and different language that you couldn't read? How difficult was it to get around in that country? <clears throat> I mean, I had this experience in Japan. Anybody been to Japan? Japan, you know, the, now they're putting a lot of things in English, you know, that they're, they're or in English lettering. Um, but most stuff in Japan is in Japanese. And there's like three scripts, you know, three written kinds of scripts in Japan. It's very difficult uh, language to, to read and understand. Um, you go to Japan, you go around, and you have no idea where you are, what anything says. It's a real handicap, right? How many, so what are the, some, where, where were you at? Uh, Mexico. Mexico? Yeah. Okay. Well, Mexico's got the same, <coughs> the same alphabet. Well, they have a couple uh, more letters. 
letters and symbols? Yeah, a couple more letters and symbols, yeah, yeah. But my, my dad used to have a family of 10. Yeah. So my grandparents were in the U.S. and in Mexico all throughout their lives. And um, one, of my, one of my aunts, the one she's older than him, I believe, she, um, she never learned how to read or write. She can barely write her name and read a little bit. Yeah. But if we go to a different place and it's a different kind of water that we drink or a different kind of anything, food or things that she's not used to seeing on a day-to-day, -day, she doesn't know what they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tough. Yeah. It's really tough. And so, you know, having the basic competencies in language in our modern society, in our developed world, very important. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it, it goes without saying that, you know, if you can't read, uh, in, our, in our society, we pick California, modern California, you can't read here. It, it's difficult. Difficult to find work. It's difficult to, to get around. You can figure out ways to do it, but it, it, it's much harder. You know, I mean, I got around Japan okay. Uh, but, you know, I had to ask people questions, and I had to find people who were bilingual sometimes, and it's difficult, right? So this is the stage in which we give our kids these basic things. Now, let's say you are a, you are uh, living in, uh, in, in a Hopi Indian tribe, um, you know, 300 years ago out in New Mexico, okay? Or you're a Yaqui Indian down in uh, northern Mexico. Um, and you are growing up and you're a kid and, and you now reach this stage, industri uh, 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 industry versus inferiority, you reach this stage. What do you think that kid's thing that they're going to learn, what are they going to learn in that society? That traditional, we'll call it traditional, traditional uh, society. What do you think they're going to learn? Probably just more how to survive. Yeah. Survival things. What, what kind of survival things are there? What? Like hunting. Hunting. Fishing. Making clothes. Building houses. You know? There's some great videos on YouTube of these people. I think they're in Indonesia somewhere. These guys making these wells out of mud and sticks and stuff. You can watch this. And it's brilliant. I mean, the, the, you know, the knowledge, you know, it, it's, it's not any less um, intelligent than learning to read or write or do arithmetic, it, 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 is, it is knowledge that is, that is specific to their environment, right? So maybe reading, and you know, some of these early cultures, you might have learned to read and write, but, it, but the, these other skills would have been really important, and this is what the children would be learning at this age. Okay, they'd be learning the basic skills necessary to survive in their culture. They might be learning ritual dances, they might be learning um, things that are really basic to their culture that, that the culture feels is necessary to live. Okay. Yes? I think also like nowadays it's, it's different versus like way back then, you know, education was not, like education regarding schooling and learning to, like you said, read and write wasn't as important versus the hunting and surviving, whereas now like yeah. it's kind of more universal, like kids have to go to school, like you know, kids are not because they have school. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. I think if you look around the world today, even in developing countries, mm -hmm. like the value is that those kids should go to school and, and learn basic, basic basics of modern technology, yeah. reading and writing, you know, and math, you know, math, basic math skills. What's the other skill now that people are talking about? Is people thinking it's going to be one of these basic skills that kids should really learn that you guys may or may not have learned as kids? Another basic skill now that people are thinking in the modern world is really important. There's a lot of debate about this right now. Com computers? What about computers? computers like what about coding? the clothes? What's that? Coding. Coding. Mm -hmm. This is a big debate now. We do not, you guys, I'm pretty certain you guys did not learn coding as a basic skill in elementary school. Okay. A lot of people are talking about now in this world that we live in, which everything is run by computers, um, that, that, that a basic skill should be that kids, kids learn some coding. And this has been a debate. There's a whole group out there that's advocating and trying to put coding education into schools. And they have been, from what I can see, they've met with a tremendous amount of resistance. Um, uh, my kid is now 16. He'll be going into his third year of high school next year and he can take a coding class as an elective, and he has to take a class in the summer to make a space in the year schedule for him to be able to take it. And he not make it easy. 
and he's going to get one class in this, his entire education. And you know, and this is a, you know, kids nowadays are going into a world where coding everything you're doing is result, you know, has has coding involved in it. You know, almost everything you do is coding involved in it. And a lot of people think that this is this should be basic skill. This should fit into the stage, you know, industry versus inferiority. Um, so if you were in a, if you were, let's say you were in a. Uh, uh, the Minister of, of Education in a country, let's say in uh, somewhere that's in the developing world, you know, what would you what would you have kids learn nowadays? Say you're in a place where people still live in a traditional lifestyle, but they're also being impinged upon by the modern world. You see these African tribes out in the middle of nowhere who live, you know, since they almost like hunter, hunter and gatherers, and yet they've got cell phones, right? You know, I mean, this is the world. The world is, everything's mixed up now. And so say you're the minister of education in one of these places. What are you going to have the kids learn? Yeah? Um, more like other languages. Other languages. Oh, that's a very interesting one. Other languages. That's very interesting because what's happened in America is that we've become less and less uh, uh, multilingual. You know, we used to, it used to be languages were, were, were a hard requirement for everybody. And, uh, and it used to be like if you look in the early 1900s in America, many people spoke other languages. So I talked about the people doing German stuff last time, you know, that, that you know, Hall was able to speak and do live, listen to Freud and read Freud in German. Um, we don't have that now as much. And that's very interesting, very interesting. And, and I think somewhat controversial, you know, because what some people might say is that we don't need a lot of language because everybody's learning English. English has become a universal language almost for the world now. By the way, that may change to Chinese in a few years, so keep your eyes open. Chinese is a very difficult language to learn, especially as an adult, um, but English may not be around. You know, it was French before it was English, right? How many of you speak French? Anybody speak French in here? Yeah. But if you were here, if you were doing this class, we were doing this in university class in, say, in the 1920s. And I read, rose and said, how many people speak French? I bet more than half the class would raise their hand. Okay? Now nobody speaks French. It's California. I can say how many people speak Spanish. Or in California, you know, a lot of people speak Spanish in California. Right? So, you know, they, I, I could say how many people learn Spanish from school and speak it fairly fluently. If they didn't learn it at home, I'd have less people raising their hands. Okay? Um, but, you know, languages are, you know, that was something that maybe was thought to be important. I'm not sure what we think as a society that's important anymore. I'm not sure about that. And so if you were the minister of that country, would you have people speaking languages? Probably would reflect on whether or not your country was bound by other places where people spoke different languages, or whether or not uh, the other language that people needed to learn was English, so you could get along with the rest of the world, you know? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Very interesting. Yes? I would, if I could add a class to the high school or even middle school curriculum yeah. today, yeah. I would add finances. Because I've seen a finances. lot of people, they literally graduate from high school, and they have no clue how to ma manage or handle their money. Yeah, that's a very good idea. That would be good. Yeah. Teach kids how to at this age about money and getting on, because again, commerce seems to be something that pretty much human societies are doing, most of the human societies are doing these days. So yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah, commerce, yeah, yeah very good. There's actually also a program on that. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them. There's a, a financial consultant, I think he, he is. His name is Dave Ramsey. They actually have a podcasting online. Yeah. Yeah. And they have written a lot of books and they have programs how to teach children, yeah. even in elementary school, about their finances. Well, it's very interesting. It's something that kids don't really learn in elementary You guys, anybody here learn about finances in elementary school or high school even? Maybe high school if you get elected, you know. But yeah, no, there's not much of that. that, that that's a good one, very good one. So in this stage, so if you don't do well in this stage, what you do is you get this feeling of inferiority, right? I'm in Japan, I'm walking around, I don't even, I can't read the street signs. I know where, I, know where, where I'm at. I feel very inferior, you know. I, I don't know how to even make change in the store when I'm buying something. I feel very inferior, right? 
So this is, you imagine this idea if you're a kid in a society and you don't get the basic stuff um, that is required to get society. You're living a hunter-gatherer society, you don't learn how to hunt. That's not going to be very good for you, right? So that would be, that would be the sense of inferiority. And again, this is something that can stick with you. Okay, as Erickson says, there's no, the, uh, kids are no longer loved simply for who they are, but they're expected to master the technology of their culture, okay? So they're expected to, to get some mastery over the technology of their culture. All right, and this is also an area where the residue from these earlier stages, if they were not, if they were not successfully negotiated, the residue from these earlier stages can can bleed over to this, and it's going to prevent the kids from becoming competent. You know, they can't get along in the dominance hierarchy, they can't find their place with the other kids, then they, it makes it very difficult to learn um, the basic things uh, that that society needs. So imagine that kid, you know, you have that kid in the class, the one who was always late, who was causing trouble, right? You know, caused trouble, he got in fights, you know, the teacher was always giving him some sort of discipline. Do you think that kid learned the basic stuff of reading and writing? You know, as much as the other kids. No, that kid had trouble with that. Anybody, anybody here? You don't have to answer this. Anybody here? That kid? You're that kid, Julie. <laughs> yeah. Was it tougher later on? Did you have to go back and really assert yourself yeah, to learn yeah. stuff? I mean, I, I think school is always like my big Freddy Krueger in the closet. Yeah. So the fact that I'm doing this now is like huge. Yeah. So it's, it's better yeah. now. Yeah. But in grade school, and through high school, it was like Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Very tough. Very tough. So this is this is so again. This is also something you know. Teachers, if they're if they're, if you go get teacher training, you're going to learn all about these Ericksonian stages. And if you're a really good teacher, you'll remember this: the kids having trouble in your class because they're not fitting in really well here. And so there's something going on, and maybe there's some intervention you can do as a teacher. Maybe there isn't, uh, but this is you might identify there's some issue going on here. With this kind of thing. Hey, Katie. Well, it was just I took an education and social inequalities class. Yeah. And a lot of like the developmental stages that kids go through that like are hindered, um, along with like parents and like how they grow up. Another thing that has a big influence is um, social class. And yes. Race. Yes. Is that Huge influence. Huge influence. Because again, if you are, if, if again, if you think of, I just think about it in terms of dominance hierarchies. If you are excluded from participating in the dominance hierarchy or put at the bottom of it because of the way you look or because of you know how much money your family has, those kind of things, that's really that's that's really going to engender this sense of inferiority here. It's going to create a lot of problems. Even if your family stuff, even if you've negotiated these things pretty well, you get to hear and there's something from the outside, you know, out in your environment is putting you in a certain place in the dominance hierarchy you have no control over. That's going to have a tremendous effect on people. And so I think this does have an effect on people. And again, you can do this by nation, you can do it by race, you can do it by socioeconomic status. You know, absolutely this is going to have a big problem, you know. This, be, this is a big problem. I mean, you know, the president right now is negotiating with, you know, North Korea, right? The North Koreans, you know, as a as a group, they are suffering from, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, this is a big deal for them. They're overcompensating for feelings of inferiority, in my opinion, overcompensating for feelings of inferiority. Unfortunately, they're doing it in a very dangerous way. Um, but, you know, this is, this, you can think about it as a society, you know, and the way they were treated. And, of course, you know, you can trace back to the Japanese invading, you know, uh, Korea and all sorts of, I mean, you go back in history. Again, you, know, I, it was you guys, I gave my lecture about colonialism, right? Colonialism is bad. Colonialism engenders this in whole societies, right? And so even after the, the colonizers have left, the, the society is left with these feelings of inferiority that then carry on from generation to generation. My dad's actually written a lot about how these feelings are transmitted unconsciously from generation to generation. And then you end up with lots of issues and lots of problems. You know, so I'm real big. I'm a real big uh, uh, naysayer about colonization. I think colonization has really screwed things up quite a bit. But again, you could also see this in just a little a microcosm of a little classroom, right? Now, in America, I will say, you know, we have a lot of problems in America. Okay, but if you go to other countries, you'll see that these class distinctions and racial distinctions are actually they're actually 
written into the law, that are written into the societal structure. You know, like the South Africa, past South Africa is an example of apartheid. You know, that, you know, if you were from an African tribe, you went to a school out here, they got no money, and if you were a white kid, you went to a school in the city and it was well funded, and it was actually, it was actually codified, right? Uh, so the one thing is in America, at least in most parts of America, is that we, we are not codifying this, this inferiority of certain groups anymore. Um, we may, we're still doing it, uh, but it's not codified into the law, at least not yet. Uh, but it, you know, it used to be, it used to be. You had Brown versus the Board of Education. You had these landmark cases, um, you know, that that were undoing that kind of thing. So at least in America, I think we have the opportunity to to um, continue to work on that. Other places, maybe that's not so easy. You know, depending where you go, um, there's a lot of this in the world, and we could have a whole discussion about racism and and socioeconomic class and dominance hierarchies. And if this was a class in evolutionary psychology, we would have that discussion. But since it's not, I won't go into that too much. But it does play a role, absolutely. It plays a role in these things too, by the way. You know, if your parents are being treated like crap and being, you know, whatever, you know, having a bad time uh, in society because society is telling them they're inferior, they're putting them down, they're not getting as much chances, it's harder for them to engender trust in their child, right? It's harder for them to engender autonomy in their child. Uh, you know, so again, these those things affect all these, all these areas. And we could talk about places where they've encoded these things. I mean, India is a good example. India has a caste system, the Varna. You know, it's traditional in India. You know, and they've now gotten rid of it. It's officially gotten rid of, but you know, it's still. Tell me if I'm wrong. It's still there. Oh, yeah. They've officially gotten rid of it. You know, but it's still there, and it still affects people, and it affects people in these ways. So those are, all the, those are all the sort of Freudian ones. And then we get up into, I mean, Freud talked a little bit about adolescence too, but we're gonna talk about, Erickson gets into this stuff in more detail. And um, the next one, ego identity versus role confusion, is probably the place that Erickson is known most for because he is the guy who uh, really, really uh, gets into this idea of identity. Identity, a person's identity. And he talks about adolescence being ego identity versus role confusion. And adolescence is a time uh, where you really start to um, come into your own. You really come into your own identity. Okay. And he talks about this. And um, this is the, uh, you know, for Freud, this is the genital stage. This is where you're. Uh, you know, to put it physiologically, this is where your pleasure now starts to uh, uh, be centered in the genitals and you kind of, you know, are learning to use the equipment, so to speak. Um, but it also has this idea about, um, it's not just, also, it's, it's, in an Ericksonian sense, it's also being part of society and finding a role in society. This is very, very, very important. Freud had a very famous saying. And um, your book has it in German, which is very cool. And Leben und Arbeiten, right? This is, and, 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 and this, this translates to love, mean love and work. So I asked Freud, what is, what is, you know, what is it to be a, a, a normal, you know, happy human being? What do you need to, to, to have to be a good human being, to be a normal, happy human being? Freud said, you need to have love and work. Okay, you need to have love, you need people in your life who you love and you have a connection with, and you need to have a work that provides some meaning and some satisfaction to you, okay, where you get to exercise uh, some competence. And really for Erickson, this, is, this becomes really important. So you find your place in life in, as an adolescent. And of course, adolescence is full of storm and drum, right? You know, it's storm and drum, this is the, the, the state, the state, you know. It's a stormy time, you know, your body's full of hormones, you're bouncing off all over the place. Maybe some of you guys can remember what that's like. You know, for me, it's a long, distant past memory, but I kind of remember what that was like, you know. Um, and then eventually that storm begins to, to settle somewhat, hopefully by the time you guys are your age now, that that's settled for you some, some, to some degree. And you are, um, you are getting a sense of yourself as a coherent individual, right? Coherent individual. 
with um, purpose, with some sort of uh, uh, ego strength related to fidelity, right? Fidelity that you have some attachment to things, you know. Um, and for for Erickson, adolescence was very crucial period. This is a really important period for him. He, he, you know, it kind of implies that Freud and other people are really are giving the short strip. This is really important. It's really when you come into your own, right? And this idea of identity. This idea of identity. And if you don't uh, figure this out, you will become very confused. You'll have role confusion. Okay. And so the idea here, as he says, is that young people begin to connect to the roles and skills they've developed, and you can turn these into a mature sense of identity. And again, Freud and, and Erickson both thought of adolescence as this moratorium, this in-between time, in-between childhood and adulthood. And what have we done as society with our, in modern society with adolescence? What have we done with it? Yeah. Stretched it out. Stretched it out. So your period of dependence on your parents is now stretched out, right? How many people here still get money from their parents? <laughs> Once in a while, if I'm lucky, right? We stretch it out, you know. I mean, I, you know, my dad helped me through college. I got money from you know. I was in my twenties, so you know. Again, are, 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 is it still? Are you still adolescents because you get money from your parents? Not necessarily. Not people my age are moving back in with their parents. I've thought about it. Well, actually, I thought about moving in with my wife's parents. My wife's parents are really cool, right? You know, I mean, you can go back to this, right? Theoretically, in a normal society, you will go through adolescence and you will become independent. You will now be able to work on your own. And that moratorium, that in-between in place will end. Okay? And so, um, but we've stretched it out. We've stretched it out. And this is something you see in modern societies. And part of the reason for this, in my opinion, is because the technical necessities for what you need to function in that society are a lot greater now. You guys need a lot more information, you need a lot more high level skills, a lot more complex stuff to go out and function in society and be independent. This is, you know, if you were in a traditional hunter-gatherer society, you learned to hunt, you learned to fish, you learned where the good hunting spots were, you learned how to build a, you know, a house, you know, you learned how to get water, you got your basic things covered, and you're done. You know, you can go off on your own, uh, you don't have to be an adolescent anymore. Right? Our society, you got to learn uh, reading, writing, uh, you know, you got to learn some math, you got to learn some statistics, you got to learn, uh, you know, how to drive, you got to learn, um, you know, a complicated finance system with lots of loans and credit and all sorts of things going on. You have to learn something about computers. You have to at least learn how to use them, if not code them to some degree. You have to learn about, you know, all sorts of stuff. There's tons of stuff out there. Just think about all the things you guys have to do in this modern age that people didn't have to do not long ago. Even when I was growing up, when I was a kid, you know, way back in you know, the Jurassic era, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you could go to high school and learn to use machine tools, and then when you graduate, you get a job as a machinist, or at least an apprentice as, you know, as a machinist, and you would be fine, right? Nowadays, it, it, it's crazy. When I was a kid, you go to school, you know, I was offered, a, um, I was offered when I was in high school, my counselor didn't think I should go to college. I, I, I was a long-haired kid, you know, and kind of looked like a, you know, sort of a hippie degenerate. So he didn't think college was right for me. So he, he said, I can get you a scholar at diesel mechanic school, right? Now, had I taken him up on that offer, I could have gone to diesel mechanic school. I would have spent a year or two uh, as an apprentice diesel mechanic, and I would have gone out and, you know, been a mechanic. And that's all I would have had to learn. You know, that would have been great. Nowadays, if you want to learn to be a mechanic, what do you have to learn? What do mechanics have to learn nowadays? What is in every part of your car? There's probably 50 of them in your car. Computers. Computers. You got to learn to code. You got to learn to read code and like you know do stuff. I mean, you know, you didn't have to do that back in the day. It's much more complicated being a mechanic now. You know, um, sometimes I wish I followed his advice. Probably making a lot more money than I am now, but be as it may. Um, this is an example. So, so we 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 have to extend out adolescence a little bit. This creates problems in our society, it creates problems for kids because it's stretched out, in my opinion, this is my opinion, I think that, uh, that it, it provides more opportunities for role confusion. Okay. 
Um, and the other thing is, and this is really controversial, the other thing is, is that, you know, you are taking college majors, traditional college majors, that are not necessarily tied to a specific job or a specific set of skills. Okay, and this is a big controversy now, um, political controversy even. Uh, our governor came out the other day, our governor who is extremely liberal, came out the other day and said, you know, we shouldn't have so many majors and classes. Well, these professors are teaching too many crazy classes. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with giving you a job, and we should get rid of all those classes and just have things that are just job-related, right? Which I thought, in my opinion, you know, not being political here, liberal or conservative, in my opinion, I just thought that was just the stupidest thing somebody could say, because it just shows an incredible ignorance about what a university education is about. You know, you're not here, this is not vocational training, you're not here to be trained to get a job, you are here to be trained to learn that you can, when you get out of here, you can continue to learn on your own. Because the one job skill you need when you leave here is to be able to learn things on your own. Because if you can do that, you can go in any field, right? And so you're learning how to learn, hopefully. Okay? That's the idea here. And you're also learning a lot, a lot of stuff that's going to help you just to be a better, more well-rounded person, which in my opinion, in a, in a civilized society, is really the main main importance of the university, in my opinion. And you can disagree with that. In my opinion, the main thing is for you to live in a civilized society, um, to, to, to learn in some way to, to develop your identity. Okay, a la Erickson, develop your identity, who you are, and um, you know, on, on your own. Not just taking your parents' values or other people's values, but actually thinking it through and developing your own things. To me, I think this is really the worth of the university. Look, vocational school, you know, the governor may want to turn this into truck driver training academy, you know, because we could turn it, everybody could be a truck driver training major and you'd all get a job when you finished. You know, I think there's plenty of good truck driving jobs. There's nothing wrong with driving a truck if that's what you want to do. But um, I, think, I think he doesn't understand what's going on here, right? And it shows a very ignorance of these kinds of things. Um, that said, you know, I, you know, what's going to happen? Um, I think the CSU is doing a good job. I think we're trying to do a good job here giving you lots of interesting things to take and that in these classes hopefully you learn to learn. Okay. Also you become curious. Curiosity. One is still in you a sense of curiosity. Okay. Sense of curiosity. Doesn't matter what your job could be. Okay. You could be a truck driver, you could be a you could be a cop, you could be a dentist, you know, but you maintain some curiosity about things. That's going to uh, serve you later in life when we get to these other stages, right? <laughs> Especially this one, generativity, really helps if you're curious. If you want to keep doing things in your life and do new things and, and keep expanding your knowledge and, and your abilities, being curious is really helpful. Mm -hmm. But our governor doesn't really realize that, so maybe somebody will talk to him about it. Okay. So, Erickson says, a sound ego identity is the only safeguard against the anarchy of drives as well as the autocracy, autocracy, autocracy of autocracy of conscience. It's a really interesting statement. In other words, ego identity, having a good identity, which is, involves having a strong ego, means that you are not driven around by your, your, your drives, by the id, by Eros and Thanatos, and you're not dictated to by the superego telling you what's right and wrong. But you can actually make rational, conscious decisions about your life and about who you are and who you want to be. Very important. So adolescence is the time when you learn, when your ego gets to the point where the ego takes command of the ship. I'm not going to be, the, the engine room isn't running things, and uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the rules aren't running things, that you are going to run things now. You are the, sort of the captain of your own ship. So I, I like that idea. Now, the obvious idea, the problem is if you, if you cannot do this, and for Erickson, not being able to do this, not being able to achieve ego identity is, is combined very, very closely with your social roles. You're not able to have a social role, role in society. You're not able to know what you're going to do in society. You're not able to have a meaningful adult uh, participation in society. Uh, role and for a lot of us that typically means jobs you know but I would caution you against 
against completely equating your social role with a job. I would think more in a wider term, think about your vocation. Your vocation, what you're called to do. It comes from the Latin, avocare, what you were called to, right? Um, what are you called, this is something very interesting to think about. What are you called to do? And so again, your adolescence, your extended adolescence, is the time where you figure out that social role. What's your role gonna be in society? Okay. If you're not able to do that, you get into role confusion. And this, unfortunately, this happens with a lot of college students because it's a really crazy world right now. We're crazy economic times. The, the job economic situation is really nuts. Uh, right now, you know, we're having some job growth. We're having a pretty good employment right now. Just a couple years ago, that was not the case. My students were graduating and complaining that there were no jobs for love or money. Um, now there are jobs, but the question is the quality of the jobs is, is, is a big question mark. Anybody, you know, there's lots of jobs, but you may want to have a job where you don't ask people if they want fries with their burger, right? You, so the quality of jobs is a question mark. And so this, this, the external situation can really influence this idea of role confusion. What's your role like? Now, if you know something, if you say, for instance, you're, you're going to be a dentist, you want to be a dentist. That is, you've known this since you were a kid, you're fascinated by teeth, you're curious about them. When you were a kid, you got a dental play set and you practiced filling cavities and all your friends' mouths. You know, you knew what you are going to do. You're going to college, you're going to get a dental degree. You know, you are less likely to have role confusion. But if you're going to college, you're not sure what you're going to do. You're going to high school, college, you're not sure what you're going to do. You think you might want to do, you think you might want, might want to do that. You may be subject to this. And unfortunately, again, because our society is, we've stretched out adolescence, we, we live in a complicated society, a lot of complicated skills that are necessary, lots of complicated jobs. This can be confusing. So my advice to you is that you need to talk to people. This is one of the reasons why myself and many of the other professors in our department are really um, available to you for uh, essentially what's career advising especially in the field of psychology at least. Okay. So I do a lot of graduate school advising to people. I do a lot of career advising for people. And I'm always happy to do that uh, for you guys. Okay. Uh, you can read my guide to applying to graduate school. It's on the site website if you're thinking about grad school. Grad school is great because yeah, it's a little confusing. So what if I just stretch things out just a little more? Stretch that adolescence out just a little more and go to grad school because then things will start to narrow down for you. And so we're big advocates on this campus of, in psychology department of trying to send you all to grad school. And you, I'll apologize for myself and my colleagues if we're twisting your arms uh, too hard because we'd love you all to go to grad school. It doesn't have to be in psychology. For me, it doesn't have to be in psychology. Uh, but we like to send you all to grad school. Because grad school will help you with role confusion and it will give you further skills in a further complicated society. And in general, on average, uh, you will do better financially if you go to graduate school. So we all encourage you. And age is not a, a limitation. If you're older, a returning student, doesn't matter. I went to a PhD program with a woman who was 75. So you can go, none of you are, are too old to go to graduate school. Okay, so we will twist your arm a little bit. I think it helps with role confusion, my opinion. My opinion. Okay. Intimacy versus isolation, the next stage. This is where basically your, uh, what's the way to say this? Your love life will consolidate. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, before I go on, I meant to mention also to role confusion can take the form of negative identity. You can form a negative identity. This happens too with people who are oppressed, right? You're oppressed, you can't get the job, nothing will happen to you, so I'm going to form a negative identity which rebels against the societal roles. Okay, so again, for Erickson, you can see problems um, with this. Okay, so it's an identity as opposed to the dominant values of, of, he says upbringing, but I would say society at large. Okay. This is what, and again, if you took the 473 class, the bizarre behavior class, uh, Deb came in and she talked a lot about people in gangs, right? Why do people join gangs? Well, one of the reasons is, according to an Ericksonian point of view, is they form a negative identity. You know, they've, they've, they've had an experience of society where they've been ostracized to some degree, they cannot uh, do the stage. There's too much role confusion between because how they're treated, and uh, they develop a negative identity. 
and the negative identities against everything in society, and then those people with the negative identity then can get together and they can form their own society, right? And again, this is the big thing that draws kids to gangs. It can be external stuff, uh, you know, prejudice in society against them. It can be uh, the, the fact that their family, family life is, is fragmented. They have a fragmented family life, and the gang can provide a, an outlet for that stuff. So you get in the gang, you have a family, you got people taking care of you, people with the same negative uh, identity values that you have, and so it becomes a very, very um, attractive thing for some people in society. Okay? And so it's a, it's a difficult, once it gets going, it's a difficult uh, pattern to break. And as you know, you may not know, as Travis knows, you know, because he's in law enforcement, we have gangs everywhere. Tons of gangs. Did Deb tell you where the MS-13, nearest MS-13 gang is? Newbury Park. New Park. She told you this time. Eh? Yeah, she told you. Good. Yeah, we have MS-13 in Newbury Park, of all places, Newbury Park. They, they keep a pretty low profile. Right? But she'll tell you where all the gangs, she worked in the gang division for a long time. But all the gangs are, right? So there's tons of gangs uh, around, and again, gangs, you can see gangs as sort of an outgrowth of doing things in society, you know, there's certain people get marginalized. Then the, 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 and again, that could be marked due to environmental conditions, some stuff from the outside. It could also do from stuff from the inside, right? Fragmentation of families, things like that. You start getting uh, role confusion and you start seeing things like gangs go. And we have tons of them, right? Uh, okay, I want to mention that. Intimacy versus isolation. The next stage, this has to do with, um, you know, essentially uh, growing up and, um, and, and being able to have a intimate, loving relationship with another person. Okay? Um, and the ability to develop a close, meaningful relationship with another person is really the main thing here. Okay? This is the main thing to be able to do this. Uh, as the book says, the young adult is, over, is able to overcome the fear of ego loss and form a close affiliation with another individual. What does this mean? This, is, this really harks back into Freud. Right, that Freud said that when you fall in love, you invest all your energy, your libido, in another person. You become meaningless. You, you, you basically give up everything about you for the other person. The other person becomes the center of your life. Right? You let yourself go for the other person. Right? And, and to be able to do this, to be able to feel secure enough to be able to do this, is a hallmark of the stage. Right? Hallmark. It doesn't mean you give up your ego completely, but you give up investing in yourself, you invest yourself in another person. Okay? And, it, and it takes a, there's a little leap of faith that, that comes with that. That's very important. Um, now, of course, what happens uh, in young adulthood is that this, um, you're able to transform the love you received as a child and to begin to care for others. Okay? Begin to care for others. And this is also the area for Erickson where, um, and again, he's looking at this from a very traditional way, is that where men and women learn to get along with one another, because men and women are a little bit different. I don't know if you guys have noticed this. You guys notice this? Guys, you notice women are a little different? Women, you notice the guys are a little different than you? There's some, not just physiologically, but the way they think about things, a little different. This is the stage where you learn to figure out, you know, uh, for Freud said, what do women want, you know? Figure out how the other gender uh, sort of operates, how to get along with them. And I think in our day and age, you can, you can now extend this into um, all sorts of uh, gender fluidities. I like that word, fluidity, gender fluidities, because, you know, we have all sorts of different kinds of genders out there. It's not just the light switch off and on. You have all sorts of intersex people, all sorts of things. Again, has anybody taken my clinical psych uh, class in, this, in the second summer session? I'll be talking about uh, intersex, gender, gender fluid uh, stuff, and different, different versions of intersex people. The book doesn't really cover it, but you should know about this because it's a big thing and it's something that's actually out there. So, I, so again, when I say men and women getting along with each other, I mean all different shades of male and female getting along with each other in whatever way uh, is, is, is useful. Okay? If you don't do this, you can't get along with another person, you can't form this kind of intimate relation with another person, uh, you become isolated. And I'm sure everybody has had a little taste of isolation and loneliness in your life. Um, at this stage, you know, if, if you can't navigate this stage, this can become, uh, sort of become, uh, you know, uh, the main modality of, of, of the way you live. You live in an isolated way. 
Okay, the next stage uh, is generativity versus stagnation. Generativity means generating things. Traditionally, this means the, the time when you become a parent. But it's more than just that. Again, Erickson extends it beyond that because not everybody becomes a parent. He's talking about becoming creative, creating something, creating new things, okay? Bringing in some sort of creation to life in your existence, okay? So this is very important. And this is a long stage. This is basically the stage of young adulthood till old age. And, um, and you want to be able to be productive and creative in many areas of life, and also in a way that shows concern for the next generation, people to come after you, okay? So very important here. Um, and if you don't do this, you will become stagnant and bored. And uh, Erickson says you will have interpersonal impoverishment. Okay? Don't have to, it used to be back in the day that people would say, oh, you didn't have kids. This is why you're, you're feeling bored and stagnant. It's because you didn't have kids. And that's a thing that everybody should do. Everybody should have kids. Nowadays, we would extend it to just doing something. You know, maybe you don't have kids, but maybe you write a book, or maybe you do something, you, you act in a play, or you do something creative, right? So Erickson extends this to anything creative, anything creative. If you don't do this, you can suffer stagnation. Okay. All right. And the ego strength thing here is care, caring for people, caring for others. And then we get to the ego integrity versus despair. This is the last stage, maturity. Okay. And this entails the ability to reflect on one's life with satisfaction. Even if all, you, all the things you want to do are not fulfilled, you didn't get to do everything on your bucket list, you still did enough of these things that you feel like you had a good life and that you can start to accept your own mortality. And it's ego integrity. And this is what you want to do. Okay. You won't have any regrets. And so this, this can involve something called a life review, where you review your life and you sit down in your old age and you start thinking back over. And you see this, you talk to older people. Anybody talk to older people? You know, talk to older people, they'll tell you this. What are they like? They'll, they'll start, you get the sense they start reviewing their life, they're thinking back over their life. Here are the mistakes I made, here are the things I did really good. And the idea for Erickson is at the end of this, they will come up with the idea that, yeah, you know, pluses and minuses, but overall, you know, things were pretty good. And now I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready to accept death. Okay? If you don't do this, too many things that, you know, you should have done, that you didn't do, um, then what will happen is that you will, uh, you will feel despair. You'll realize there's not enough time for me to do the things I wanted to do. And I waited too long, I didn't do the things I wanted to do, painted myself into a box, um, I didn't take care of those who I loved. I didn't um, impart my wisdom to anybody, and you'll start to feel despair. Okay. Yeah, so this is the best. So this is thing. So this is a good stage to be thinking about now, so that you know it's like, well, you know, I can always do that thing. I can always do that manana. You know, that I tell students to. So I, you know, I'm going to go out and work for a while. I can go to graduate school in a few years, right? Mm, why don't you go now? You know, because. Later on, it may be hard to go back to grad school, and you may have, have, have some despair when you realize it's too late. Okay, so it's the same kind of idea here. It's okay. a lot. Questions about these things? Questions about it. Make sense? Can you guys relate to a lot of this stuff? Okay. So let's do this. So the rest of the thing he's going to talk about, um, you can read the rest of the book. Erickson is known for psychohistory. It's a very important thing that he did. And here you can look at the summary of this. Erickson is known for psychohistory. Um, he, he actually wrote about some historical figures like Martin Luther. Um, and he also talked about differences in development, uh, girls being more attuned to inner space and boys outer space. I don't know about that, but debate that, but you know, he talked about this. Um, Research methods, you know, he's very qualitative and, you know, kind of following the tradition that we've been seeing in these guys. Um, they have not done longitudinal research in these things. I mean, maybe by now, but it's expensive to do longitudinal research. And Levinson has suggested some developmental issues are always present in adulthood. Well, my answer to this is duh, right? Of course they are. Okay. 
and culture and ethnicity are also important to these things. Again, this is a coherence theory, true. It seems true to us because it's a coherent model. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll wait for next time to do Dan McAdams. We'll talk about uh, him really quickly. Dan McAdams is a guy who was studied under Erickson at Harvard, and he's kind of been, I guess he's a guy who's seen as sort of carrying on the legacy of Erickson, that's why she included him in the book. And um, he talked about his developing identity by constructing a conscious and unconscious narrative of the self. So he talks a lot about narratives that we kind of come up with a storyline for our own lives. So he kind of puts it in the metaphor of a storyline, right? So we're creating a story of our own lives. So these developmental stages we go through, we're creating a story of ourselves, right? And then when you get to the last stage, what you're doing is reviewing the story to see if it turned out okay, right? It's kind of the same idea here. And he talks about the self developing as we proceed through these cycle stages of development. What he's talking about in the self to me sounds a lot like what Erickson really means when he talks about ego identity. I think those are kind of synonymous in my opinion. Okay. The defining the self, again, the same idea, he kind of redefines Erickson's things and looks at like these sort of storyline kinds of things, right? Optimism, pessimism, agency and communion, identity, myth-making, talks a lot about making myths, you know, your own life is a mythological story. And in middle age, developing a generative, generativity script. Uh, McAdams was really big on generativity. That was his main area of focus. Right? And you can look and see how you measure up. So he thinks if you're generative, you would be doing these things here. Okay. Volunteering, trying to be creative in other activities, assuming responsibility for others, having children or adopting them, teaching important skills, having a positive impact on others, being committed to other people, groups, and activities, providing advice, believing that one's contributions will survive after death, and feeling needed by other people. Yeah, I think this is okay. I mean, personally, my bias is that, I, uh, my thought is that I think there's a bias here. I think he's, I think he's got a values bias, in my opinion. I, you may disagree with me. Um, nothing wrong with these things, but I would say maybe there's more to it than just these things. Um, I don't know. I would elaborate more on the creativity part of this. That, that's just me. Okay. Things are indicative of creativity. Again, similar kinds of things here. I found this to be very Pollyannish. Um, when we get to the the module on existential psychology, you'll see the existentialists will really disagree with a lot of this stuff. Really rather vehemently disagree with this. Okay. Um, really, belief that negative experiences can be transformed into positive outcomes. See, I would say that they can be transformed sometimes. And sometimes they're not able to be, and, and the ability to accept that is important. This, I find this a little Pollyannish for me, just personally. Yes? What is Pollyannish? Pollyannish uh, is too optimistic, overly optimistic about people. Okay. I find this really overly optimistic. Uh, also, I think uh, it, it creates an ideal that's very hard to achieve. That all my negative things have to be transformed into positive. No. We also learn to be able to, to accept negative things. And when I walked the corner around yesterday and I saw that bird, bird halfway in the mouth of a snake, you know, I had to accept that, you know, not all negative experiences can be transformed into positive outcomes, especially for that bird, you know. He was being transformed into food, you know, before my very eyes, you know. And part of this being able to just accept that. That's the circle of life. You know, I went and posted on Facebook, put a picture up, circle of life, you know. I was not happy about that. I felt somewhat guilty that I didn't pick the bird up and move him somewhere, you know. I knew the snake was around, you know. I didn't move him. I felt guilty about that. You know, I, I can transform that into a positive experience completely. I mean, I'm trying to. I've been in Facebook posts, and you know, but I mostly was accepting that that was a bad thing for that bird. That bird did not, you know, the parents were not happy. You know, so you know, I, I find this a little optimistic. And it's just it might be me personally, but I really like existentialism. That's why we get to existentialism, you're going to know why I like it so much. Okay? But I think this is a little bit. Early belief in having special advantages. No, sorry. Inside, I'm saying, give me a break. You know, actually, I'm saying, give me an effing break. But that's just me. 